Okay, so um, Sagara spoke about uh, the governance center, uh, its features, its capabilities. So I'm going to talk about how some of our customers have used the governance registry and how governance works in the real world. Um, okay, so the agenda for today is as follows. I'm just going to quickly talk about service governance and service registries in general. Uh, a quick intro to WSO governance registry, not going to dive too deep, too deep into that, uh, because Sagar already did a fantastic job. And um, next is how customers use the WSO governance registry. So I'm going to talk about three customers. Um, so I'm not going to talk about their um, general registry requirements, but some special requirements that they had um, so that I can talk about them so that you can understand how the governance registry can work. So the three use cases are as follows. Uh, manage service documentation. Uh, the second one is unification of governance registry and API manager. So uh, to explain that, I will be doing a quick intro to WSO2 API manager, uh, just for the sake of clarity, in case you haven't already heard about the API manager. And then the third use case is the use of workflows and publishing to external gateways. Um, so challenges with SOA. So, um, um, so when, uh, when you're implementing uh, an SOA, challenges arise when you create an interconnected SOA. Um, so as your business or as your business undergo change, it's important that uh, you have an SOA that adapts accordingly. So it's a must. So if you have a large number of services as part of your service-oriented architecture, how do you decide and prioritize which functions to expose? How do you keep track of your um, uh, services? How, do pe how will people uh, discover these services that have been exposed? So if there's a lack of visibility and a lack of governance, that leaves room for things like service proliferation, service duplication, and uh, other regulatory compliance issues. So the Gartner definition for SOA governance is ensuring and validating that assets and artifacts within the architecture are acting as expected and maintaining a certain level of quality. Um, so when your business changes, uh, especially with mergers and acquisitions, the number of platforms, the number of services, uh, the number of consumers, the number of exposed APIs also increase rapidly. Um, so you need to uh, have a governance solution um, that keeps track uh, or, or provides consistent visibility uh, to all these changes. Um, so characteristics of an SOA registry. Um, by definition, it's a central database that includes artifacts for all services that are planned for development, uh, that are in use, and the services that have been retired. So the registry is the driver of a catalog of services. Uh, it should uh, provide capabilities for service consumers and providers to search for these services. And uh, service metadata is updated throughout the service definition lifecycle. So uh, the WS2 governance registry is more than just a registry. Um, so it allows you not only to store and manage and search uh, just services, but any kind of assets. Uh, the assets can be services, APIs, policies, projects, applications, people. You can define your assets, and it's all about managing those. So it allows to secure the access to assets and provides notification support, supports lifecycle management, and also includes a store and publisher with rich and enhanced user experience. So these are some of the capabilities provided by the governance registry, I haven't mentioned everything, of course. Um, so, okay, so the interesting bit. How do our customers uh, use the WSO2 governance registry? Okay, so I said earlier that I'm gonna talk about three uh, customers. So let's uh, talk about the first one. So this customer wanted to uh, manage uh, service documentation. 
right? Um, so, uh, so let's say there's an architect who identifies a service candidate, and he wants to be able to query the service registry um, and see if that service is available. So if that service is not available, um, uh, he will uh, request uh, for, a, uh, for a service. And uh, let's say he found the service, then he would request for consumer registration. Then let's say he found a service um, that is close enough, but does not uh, exactly fulfill the requirement. So you, he wants to request for enhancements. So that's, um, that's an example of, uh, of a new service version or requesting for a new service version. And then if that service doesn't exist at all, then you request for a brand new service. Then uh, uh, for in, in both cases where you request for a, s a new version and also request for a new service, uh, that service goes through a service life cycle, uh, you know, initial stages where it's in design stage, then in development stage, testing stage, uh, and then in uh, production state. So uh, to implement this scenario, these were their registry requirements. They wanted to be able to add, change, edit, and customize service metadata, access based on role, uh, have service lifecycle management, a robust keyword search, ability to track service pedigree, that is uh, to see version differentiation, uh, service consumer registration, and also support for data import and export. Uh, so they wanted to be able to import data from uh, Excel sheets as well as uh, export to Excel sheets. So here's the governance registry in action. Um, so uh, this is after the architects identified the need for a new service. Uh, uh, so this is where uh, he identifies that, okay, this service is not there, so he needs to design or create a service request. So number one, the first step is where he identifies a service and functions and uh, adds that to a service and function tracker. So that's a system which is based on uh, Excel sheets. So once all, those inf all that information is added to the Excel sheet, the governance registry pulls that information and uh, creates service information. So this is uh, prelim preliminary data. Um, and then uh, the architect will design and update the governance registry once the service has been properly designed and they will update the metadata accordingly. And then the developers come into the picture. Uh, then they'll start working on the development of the service, and they will develop it and update uh, the metadata in the service registry. And then the service is now in a uh, uh, developed state. Then the, then the same flow uh, with the testers and the DevOps guys. Um, and then once the service is in uh, DevOps state, uh, the governance registry must export service information to separate systems. So they had um, an EVTS system um, and a full service catalog that they wanted to maintain, uh, a separate uh, system. And uh, they uh, exported all that data to these systems. Okay, so the second use case. So I believe um, this is uh, a very important use case. Uh, because um, uh, this use case paved the way for the new governance registry 5 series. Okay, so the use case is unification of governance registry and API manager. So, um, so the background, uh, oh, so the customer didn't uh, initially have a governance solution in place. So there was service proliferation and duplication, and then later they started to use the governance registry to manage and govern various artifacts. Uh, so open rest services, uh, whistles, schemas, etc. And uh, the governance team also handles WS2 API manager, and it's used to expose uh, their APIs. So in case you don't know uh, the, um, uh, gov the API manager, uh, so this is how it works. So uh, the API manager consists of uh, four, key, four core components. There's the publisher portal and the store portal. And there's a key manager component and a gateway component. So the service developer uh, will create an API uh, in the API manager's publisher. So the actual service resides elsewhere. 
And then, um, so that API will go through an API lifecycle. And once it gets published, it will be propagated to the store and the gateway. So that's the second step. Um, then you will get the consumers, the API subscribers, who want to go to the store and find APIs. They will go to the store and find that API and then subscribe to, a, to an API. So then the key manager must issue uh, OAuth through tokens. And uh, that's done. So during the runtime, when the subscriber um, subscribe or, or invokes that uh, API, starting from number five, you can see uh, she provides the OAuth through token and um, uh, the request hits the gateway, and the gateway will apply throttling policies and also check uh, for the validity of that key. And it will communicate with the key manager, and if the key manager approves it or says this key man key ma the OAuth token is valid, then the gateway will uh, publish events to the data analytics server and dispatch the service request to the actual service. So that's how the API manager works. So uh, what is the problem? What was their problem? So this is pre-GVEG uh, 5 series, so before governance registry 5.0. Um, so they had the governance registry solution and the API manager solution. OK, so they had two main problems. So here you can see um, in the governance registry, the service consumer, the administrator, the service developer, they all accessed the management console of the governance registry, right? So, um, so there were no separate views. Everyone accessed the management console, and it was kind of messy, right? And then the second problem was, um, so the second pro problem is indicated uh, with the uh, flows, the numbered flows. So the second problem was, okay, so a service developer creates a service um, in the governance registry. But when they want to do API management, they have to go again to the API manager and add all that service information all over again. So uh, that's, that was uh, cumbersome. They had too many services. They didn't want to waste time adding service information uh, in two systems. So these were their problems. So how did governance registry uh, um, solve this problem? So because of this requirement, uh, we did major changes to the governance registry, and we came up with uh, GREG 5, right? And um, so the solution, uh, so the, to address the first problem, um, we came up with uh, separate views for different roles. So you have the service developers accessing uh, the governance publisher, and the store users using the governance stores, and the administrators uh, um, using the management console. So they had the separate views. So we created separate views uh, for the governance registry. And then to address the second problem, which was um, you know, not uh, create services twice, or do it twice, and do it in one go. Uh, so check the numbered flow here. So the service developer creates a service. Then, um, then that service will go through a service lifecycle, and it's when, when it's ready to be published as an API, uh, it will uh, be published to the API manager's publisher, as well as, it, uh, as well as appearing in the governance registry's own store, right? So you do, uh, uh, so there is, once it's published, it will also be published to the API manager's publisher. And then the API manager, uh, in, in the API manager, that API will go through its own API lifecycle, and um, then you can do the usual API management tasks where the API is published to the gateway and store. And um, okay, so they also want to do go one step further and have a common store and publisher. So this is what they want to do next. Uh, this uh, capability is already available. Uh, we have done that. Uh, with the governance registry, but this is what the customer is trying to do right now. So they want to be able to use uh, one publisher and one store, basically a centralized store and, store and publisher for both governance registry and API manager. So then the API manager will only have the gateway and the key manager. Uh, so this means all the assets 
uh, will be published or will be uh, um, in the publisher and the store of the governance registry, including services, APIs, and whatever other assets that they have. So uh, to um, let you know some advantages of a common store and publisher, um, so that's having one stop place to manage all assets. So there is a one central publisher to govern all the assets and one central store to explore all the assets. And then, um, uh, so there is a complete store and publisher via GREG uh, if you already have a separate gateway and a separate key manager existing. So let's say you already have a gateway in your organization. Um, you already have a key manager. And what you just want uh, are some portals, web portals to do API management. So then there is absolutely no point in you purchasing a brand new API management solution when you, when you have a partial capability. And then also if you are an existing or if you already have a governance registry uh, instance running in your setup, then, uh, but you also need to do API management, then uh, that's, uh, you can just, you, you don't have to buy the API manager product, right? Uh, you don't have to buy a complete API management solution for that. Um, so then another advantage is to visualize dependencies across APIs and other asset types. So uh, the governance registry will be storing whistles, um, uh, other maybe waddles and swagger files and so on. So you can um, see the relationship between the APIs in your API manager and then the assets in your governance registry all in one view. So um, they had some other registry requirements, so they wanted to see graphical views of associations and dependencies between assets within the registry. Uh, they wanted to see or remove multiple resources from governance registry in a single step. They wanted to be able to group or categorize assets and track updates and modifications and do bulk uploading and do bulk deleting of services. So um, as Sagar explained earlier, these are some of the new um, um, charts, views that we have in the GREG 5 series. And um, so this customer was very significant um, when it came to uh, uh, the, when it came to uh, coming up with the new design for WSO2 governance registry. So that's that for that customer. So the third and final use case, um, so use of workflows, so that's a separate use case, and publishing to external gateways. So this customer had uh, these requirements. So they wanted workflows to be plugged for subscriptions, and they also wanted to promote uh, services to external gateways or deployed in external gateways. Um, so some other uh, registry requirements were to be able to create new types of assets, uh, manage subscription for an asset, and also they wanted multi-tenancy support at the governance registry layer to provide separation for their internal departments. Okay, so this is governance registry in action for the workflow integration part. Okay, so let's say, um, okay, so before that, uh, to integrate workflows, uh, you can use the WS2 business process server. Uh, so if you want to run um, uh, long-running stateful processes, maybe if you uh, want uh, human intervention, then you can use the business process server. So the governance registry was integrated with, with the business process server to uh, implement workflow integration. So a use case will be as follows. So this is a very oversimplified picture and not the actual um, use case. Uh, this is just for you to get an idea uh, about how you can do workflow integrations. Uh, so let's say there's a business analyst who wants to create a new service requirement. So let's say the service requirement is um, an asset type that, that is in the governance registry. Um, so then the governance registry, uh, maybe through a lifecycle executor, can start a new workflow by calling the BPS workflows, sorry, by calling the REST APIs of the business process server and creating a workflow in the BPS. And as the first step of the workflow, the BPS can notify the architect. Uh, and then the architect can verify the requirement and approve or disapprove. So if, um, if it was approved, the BP 
um, let's say the second step is uh, to notify the developer to start development. And if it was to, and if the state was, or the status was in uh, this approved state, uh, then the business process server can terminate the workflow. Okay, so the uh, next use case was to uh, uh, integrate with external gateways. So in this, you can see uh, there is both the ESB as well as the IBM data power. So they were using both of these products. So they wanted the ESB uh, to do some... Um, um, service mediations, transformations, etc., and they used the IBM Data Power as their API gateway. So they wanted to be able to create services in the governance registry and uh, publish uh, 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 API information or publish APIs or propagate APIs in both of these systems. So what I would like to highlight here is the capability for the governance registry to not only integrate with WSO2 products but also with um, uh, products by other vendors, such as IBM Data Power. <laughs>